If you're not quite obsessive enough for a Lancer Evo, you drop down to a Lancer Rally Art. And now you can get it with a hatch on the back. Ultimate Pseudo Evo or just trying to be too many things at once? Let's find out and check the tech. The big headline on the Lancer Sportback is the Sportback. The hatch makes a big difference in the car's look and practicality, but if it transforms the car, it is deceptive. Almost nothing has changed from the C-pillar forward. Now this car base is going to come with a pretty pedestrian head unit, but that's not our concern because we're loaded up with both a nav package and an incongruous Recaro package that brings us these, I think, over-the-top boy racer seats, more on those later, but also a whole lot of toys in the head unit. Rockford Fosgate audio system to begin with, and that means it thumps more than it's elegant. I respect the power of the thing, but I can't say that I actually like the sound of it. We've got 710 watts of power coming out of this thing. I don't know where they get these numbers, but it's a lot of power for a little car, if it's being rated honestly. And one of the speakers, I think there's nine around the cabin, one of which is a big old sub out in the back that's mounted very obviously. And as you might imagine, with a 10-inch sub showing like that, this is a car that's got a showy sound to it. It has all kinds of bottom end. You've got some sound field or faux DSP stuff here. I'd recommend you leave that off where it gets really kind of artifacty really quick. And you've got some presets here for different types of EQ. But mostly you're going to want to roll your own. But here's the key, because it's Rockford Fosgate, you've got what they call punch level, which is beyond bass. It's super thumping low end, almost subsonic stuff. And it just makes music sound ridiculous, unless you're playing a certain narrow niche of music. When you're on other sources that are compressed, particularly with satellite radio, it sounds like living hell. This system does nothing for that overly compressed, kind of edgy, brittle sound of sat radio. So that was just fatiguing to me. Now, as you can see, though, while I'm getting around the audio system and talking, things move pretty quickly. Nice, snappy response. That's because we've got a hard drive-based system. That dead giveaway is when you lift up the display here, and you see you've got a hard drive back there, which says hard drive navigation, but it's also got some space on it for music. And then you've got a single-slot CD player up here. Also, this jack here, which nothing in the manual tells me what it is. It's not an aux, that's down there. I don't think it's a headphone jack. It's just weird to have that hidden and unlabeled, but we'll leave that for now. You've also got AM and FM, no HD radio, Sirius satellite radio we talked about, and the auxiliary is a little disappointing. The aux jacks are down here. A couple of RCAs for audio only. That's just weird. Why not a mini jack? Oh, and by the way, this disc drive up here is also DVD compatible, so you can park and watch a movie. Let's look at some technology beyond this upgraded head unit. Now, this gearbox here is one of the great parts of this car. We'll talk more about it when we get on the road, but this is your only choice gearbox, a twin clutch SST, which is a really great automated manual dual clutch transmission, my favorite in the business. And you've also got your paddle shifters up here to influence those gear shifts, and look what happens when I turn the wheel. They don't go with it exactly as they shouldn't. That's good thinking. This little switch here behind the gear shift selector gets you into one of two modes, a sport mode or a normal mode. The normal mode is pretty numb. It's kind of like your high MPG mode where the car lugs along at the lowest possible RPM. Put it in sport mode and it's a whole different car. It won't even come down below 3,000 RPM. It's a different animal and it's just fun. Over here is your all-wheel control. That's their version of all-wheel drive. Three modes on this guy, tarmac, gravel, snow, You'll be on tarmac all the time. In most cases, this is not the kind of car you're going to take into the snow if it's of any significance. Now, our car has this Recaro seat package, which, in addition to the Recaro seats, brings you some cabin tech, but the seats deserve some attention as well. Really ambitious bolsters down around your thighs, around your flanks, even up here on your shoulders. Not terribly adjustable, I've got to say, and manual in that they are. But then they got these great big massive headrests up here with this kind of scary Darth Vader face. The issue is, these are the kind of seats you want on the weekend, and then during the week, unless this is your second car or your track car, you're getting fed up with them. They're very, uh, shall we say, annoying. Okay, in the engine bay on a car that's a rally art, you're going to get a pretty decent motor. Two liter inline four, kind of a little guy, with a single turbo. 237 horsepower, 253 foot-pounds of torque. Good numbers for a car this size, and the MPG is pretty good as well, 1725, considering its performance credentials. I found a lot of turbo lag, though. This is not one of those cars that has that magical, almost 
transparent bit of turbo lag. This one's got a whole bunch of it, especially for a 21st century vehicle. The nav rig is pretty basic, has an okay display and rendering. There's no live traffic. It does have a unique feature called diamond lane guidance that plots the use of HOV lanes. You can only control this unit with touch or the annoying little fiddly stick button thing. Voice command on this car is only for hands-free calling. Overall, I found the driving experience frustrating. There's a lot of turbo lag by 21st century standards. If you say it takes a couple of seconds for the power to arrive, you're being literal. And that's a long time for a performance car. Covering for that laggy over small motor is the best dual clutch automated manual gearbox in the biz, luckily. The TC SST is a perfectly good automatic for daily work, and then when pressed for performance, it shifts like you wish you could. It's been my favorite of its type since it arrived on the market in 2007 and makes a fool of some very expensive German gearboxes. The sport mode really changes things, and when you're in it, this car just refuses to come down below three grand. Where the car frustrates is that it's either too frenetic or too lazy. In sport mode, it's just buzzy too much. In normal mode, it's hanging on to high gears and lagging too much. Add to that the over-the-top Recaros, which I wouldn't option, and that big roof-mounted wing, and eh, there's a weird mixed message here. But when pressed, this can be a very inspiring rally-bred car, but... I don't know that many of us drive that way that often. And bring one of these to track day and you better get ready for the endless ribbing about how you talked your spouse into loosening up your leash for a few hours.